what's up? Welcome to Shelf Stories, the channel that tells tales from games, books, and life. I am your host, Jason. Thank you so, so much for stopping by for this latest episode of Shelf Help, the show where I give tips and tricks on how to become a happier gamer and a happier person, only it is not just me this time. I had the distinct pleasure a few days ago of being invited onto a stream uh, by David Waldman. He is from Ultimate Team Up, a playtesting group, and also a content creator puts things out for the masses, uh, conversations like this. And he invited me to a panel for mental health. And it was an absolute pleasure. With his kind permission, I am reproducing that show for you and for the audience here at Shelf Stories. I was joined by Haley Twyman Brack from Malthus Games, also a psychotherapist uh, working uh, in the cognitive behavioral therapy model, which is my uh, preferred model. Also joined by Alan Girding from Tuesday Night Games, a psychology professor. We got into a lot of conversations around safety, um, talking about you know keeping spaces safe and how to uh deal with people who upset us how to deal with it when we say upsetting things you know how to own things uh how to navigate the impact and or intent and impact divide uh where to seek mental health how to deal with stress stress that's caused either within the board gaming space for whatever reason or outside and you're looking for board games to escape so a wide-ranging conversation. It is split up into three parts. I'm doing the intro here because the intro uh, originally recorded got a little bit messed up audio-wise, and you'll hear that in the first clip here. Uh, a little bit of an echo uh, when Haley is speaking. However, it it, it regulates, and uh, we get into a very good, clear-sounding conversation. Very soon after, uh, I will uh, resume the clip. So without further ado, uh, check out this panel, Mental Health in Gaming. Lots of great tips and tricks for you to be a happier gamer and a happier person. Later, everybody. Uh, yeah, that's a great point, Alan. Actually, um, I like what you're talking about there. And this is something I wanted to bring up. This... Uh, you know, what do you, you know, when you're attending conventions, you have a right to feel safe, uh, you know, and secure. And I think this is an issue, not just with the pandemic, but also in the before times. And I'm going to put us kind of on the spotlight, Alan, as cishet white guys, something we don't have to deal with is this feeling of, all right, I'm attending a convention. Do I feel safe? You know, if you're a black indigenous person of color, if you're a woman, if you're gender nonconforming, if you're a LBGTQ individual, uh, if you're from another marginalized group, I know a lot of people have um, um, confided in me that, you know, I don't always feel safe. I don't always feel welcomed in these spaces. And, um, you know, what what can, you know, everybody, you know, obviously, like, like you and me, Alan, people that don't necessarily think of it before, but other people as well, you know, how can we, you know, kind of like discuss this? How can we make everybody feel safe on attending convention? And also, you know, if somebody confides you, you know, I don't really feel safe on this person. Like this person's being like, like Alan, you say sometimes, this person's being a creeper. Like, I don't know exactly what they're doing, but it's creepy. So, you know, how can we, can we do that? So whoever wants to, to start there. I think both, you know, people are advocating for themselves. Like, you know, I want to, you know, I like playing board games. I want to feel safe there. I'm a woman. You know, why, why should I have to worry about, you know, guys leering at me or making creepy comments or, you know, in, you know, doing, you know, um, kind of patronizing behavior. Why should I have to put up with that? You know, rather than, Oh, that person's just a jerk. You know, that's just, that's just their, you know, sense of humor there. You can kind of answer that from two different perspectives. Um, um, no one as a no mental health professional, but two as a as a, as a, as a woman, woman who's been to board game conventions. No, no. And as a woman who's been to board game conventions, no. no. I, I, I just have to you know, no one, one check, check my privilege because I, I am I am a white, a white woman. woman. Uh, I am a white, white heterosexual woman. woman. Um, and, I and I also, also know that, you know, I, I have training in communication and whatnot when I say this, but, but no, there, there are have been times, times where I have dealt, dealt with um, blatant sexism, sexism, I have dealt, dealt with um, aggressive behaviors, I have dealt with, you know, also the boundary pushing, 
the, the I guess, guess creepy mysticism you've, you've, you've kind of said, said where, where you know, you know, there's, there's a blurry line between you know, is this acceptable as this person across my mouth and what? And each time something that, that, that I have called it out, it has stopped. Now, now I know, again, that's easier for me to say because, you know, I am. I'm trained in communication. I call people out the bullshit all the time and keep counseling, it's not my job. But um, also, as being you know, a white woman, woman, I know that's easier for me, easier said than done. done. But, but each time that I've done that, that um, it has stopped the situation. situation. Now, now um, you know, if you are in that situation, you know, so, so what I would say is, you know, don't, don't be afraid to speak up. And, don't, or, and if you're not comfortable speaking up in front of others or calling that person out, find your safe people. Um, you know, whenever I was first going to board game conventions or whenever I go to large conventions in general, I scope out who my safe people are, whether that is, you know, people I'm traveling with, whether that is friends that I've made, whether that is if I'm traveling to a convention or, you know, going to do a training in another state by myself, then I know where, you know, security is located. I know where any kind of emergency detail is. So if you feel unsafe, um, kind of go in with a plan, scope out who your safe people are. That way, if something happens, which hopefully it, it, it doesn't, and you feel uncomfortable, don't feel like addressing it, find your safe people just to talk to you. That's just a, hey, I'm feeling uncomfortable. I'm feeling like my boundaries are violated. Can I just like chill with you? Can we go get a snow cone? Find your safe people. <laughs> and from, you know, someone who is, you know, I am Puerto Rican, but I have, I check all the other boxes, as I said, and all that thing. You know, I, I've made a, a mission of my channel to, you know, I am an ally, right? I am... I've, I, I, this is not like a both sides thing. I, this is, I am radically dedicated to making this as safe and diverse and multicultural space and multi, you know, perspective space, you know, genders, everything. And like people, so it's like, I, I want to put myself out there. It's like, okay, I'm not just like a, a, a cause a lot of board gamers do that. Oh, we're all nice. And you know, everybody's nice and everything. Nice is the problem people. <laughs> Nice is the problem. Nice allows us to skate by on this stuff because what happens is when there's when something bad happens, well, then the victim feels like they have to be nice and they silence themselves because they're trying to be not cause trouble and blah, blah, blah. blah. And it's like, well, sometimes you do need to speak up and so and uh, both on the, you know, the victim perspective, but also in order to help a, a person who is on that victim and feel comfortable, other people have to speak up too. We see it. You know, this isn't a, it drives me nuts when people are like, oh my God, there's a problem. And it's like, look at any comment stream on YouTube or a Twitch stream. Like, you know, look at the the moderated posts. Like you'll, you'll see certain posts that are just like moderated, 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 moderated. And like, there's a problem. There's a problem. And for various reasons, we can go into whatever the reasons are, but like, just we do have a problem, people. And the, the first step to us stopping a problem is admitting we have it. And, you know, step up and be like, I am a safe person. I will back you up if you feel comfortable. I got your back. From Jump Street. You see me at a convention. Everybody, you, know, you, you see me at a... Not this year. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I still feel like the board game community is, is, a, is a family. And I do treat it as a community. Not everybody feels that way. Some people feel like, oh, I'm just showing up. And this isn't a community. This isn't a family. I'm just showing up to play games and leave. <laughs> in that, in that lack of kind of like cultivating of the space, a lot of the problems can come in. So it's like, okay, no, we're going to own this. This is a community. We have, you know, we need to safeguard this community. And I try to be as nice as possible. And we'll get into that later about like how to do it. And like in a way that doesn't like start all the flame, but just be willing to do it. So A, admit the problem and B, be willing to put ourselves out there as let's, we can team up on this and, and actively make things safe for people. Jason and Haley, yeah. you're nailing it because I have so many personal stories where I've embarrassingly been on the side of the wrong, but due to ignorance. And that, I know that right. defense only carries me so far, but my point is it's because of the people that brought voice to the issues that I became aware of them because I didn't even know. I didn't know because a lot of times people don't realize that the way one person acts towards you is not the way that they act towards another. There could be someone that you consider even a friend that in reality is very unfriendly and maybe even predatorial to others. So I've I've been on the end of not realizing like, hey, I think that person's okay. Oh, I didn't know all these stories and I totally believe them. 
And I think one of the reasons that so many people historically are scared to bring voice, as both my co-panelists have alluded to or directly said, is because of the nice culture, but also maybe because you may feel that you'll be ostracized. And I think one of the big issues is that a lot of people think that confrontation equals hostility. Right. And it doesn't mean that you can be so confrontive right. and not be hostile. And I'm very, very grateful that I'm good friends with Haley. And I, I've seen her correct someone in person at a convention. And it's a very powerful thing, not because, Haley, you're incredibly threatening or hostile. You're just very direct and bold, something that anyone could learn from. And it immediately cuts right to the point where there was no room for nonsense. It wasn't angry. It wasn't necessarily derogative at all. It was just, this is how I feel. This is how is you're making me feel. Mm -hmm. Stop. It's not acceptable to me. And they can't disagree with your feelings, with you feeling uncomfortable. They can't. And I saw you shut someone down really well and educate them very well. So props to both of you again. And I feel, again, very fortunate that I've worked at a prison system where anytime I'm feeling uncomfortable, there's officers all over the place, and we have very specific guidelines and what we're supposed to do when we don't feel safe or we see someone else who isn't feeling safe. And even on the college campus, we have very designated safe zones and campus public safety. And safe zones are these areas where people have been trained and certified to be allies for people that are in trouble. And I love that at conventions, they have the ally ribbons that you can put on your badges. But if we're being very realistic, and I'm not trashing the ally ribbons because they're great, but at the same time, anyone can wear them. So you never mm -hmm. necessarily know how much training or how much sincerity there is. And it would be great if there could be a system in place like safe zoning and college campuses that would be welcome to the convention. So just echoing Haley's point, I think part of the homework is finding those safe places ahead of time. But the responsibility shouldn't just be on the people that are mm -hmm. victims. It should be on all of us as a community as well, is making sure that even if you don't feel that you are in danger and you have whatever plot, white, cisgender armor you have, do your job of making sure that you make yourself available and know all of these resources as well. So if someone doesn't feel comfortable coming to you, maybe you will be able to help disseminate that information to everybody else so that it can spread those safe zones. I love what both of you said. Like it's it's one thing, you know, being an ally, but in being an actual ally, you have to be that advocate. You know, if you see the things, you call them out. If you, whether or not it's happening to you, like if you see this happening to your friends or to, you know, someone who looks very uncomfortable at another at another table. You no, know, being an ally means being an advocate. So using your voice. So I, I love what both of you guys said. Just want to echo and give you guys props for that. I think it's awesome. <laughs> you could be an ally, but also be in solidarity. Like, right? like solidarity is going to be the big word, right? Yeah. And solidarity means crossing a line. You got, you know, and there's going to, and that line to cross is very uncomfortable for people because it's like, you're going to have that snap back. There's always snap back when you, when you, you kind of make a change, right? And the snap back is going to be like, well, you know, you are actually causing the problem because you're the one that's talking about all this stuff. And if we talk about it all the time, then we're not going to actually focus on the games. Let's just focus on the games, right? We're just playing games over here. And we, we've had a, a long run of that. And we see what's happened. We've seen a lot of people being driven from the space. We've seen a lot of people, or maybe we haven't seen people, Right. Like it is all, and you know, it, it was, you know, kind of chicken and egg thing. Like, okay, we become more diverse. Why we become more diverse? How we become more diverse because of a natural progression, because we get better over time, or because people have advocated. And I'm of the opinion that it's number two, not number one. Even if some people think that it's number one, it doesn't conform with my experience. And so it's like, you know what? I'm just going to, you know, go for it and say, you know what? It's safer because of the advocacy. It's safer because people open their mouth. And if you do it right, like Haley was saying, you know, there is training involved. So I think there needs to be kind of, and that's the why, thank you, David, for having this. The trained people need to kind of set the pace, you know, but that's not, it doesn't, you don't need, you don't, it doesn't like, you don't need a, a degree. <laughs> you just need to level up a little bit. And, you know, the people, uh, like the people on this panel are, are definitely willing to help. Yeah, Jason, I think, I think history would agree with you that the advocates are the ones that have changed 
the society for the better. Absolutely. I think so. <laughs> I, I don't know any real <laughs> historical examples of people just letting things go and it making great change. Oh, yeah. but women just found their way in after 40 just, years since. <laughs> wow, board gaming? That's so great. Why didn't somebody tell me? That's exactly that's how it happened. <laughs> just, oh. <laughs> What women designers and what <laughs> they you know we let them in it's, it's like no it is not exactly it is not we're it, evolving it, yeah this is not like natural evolution it is it, it you, you gotta like we you know people who have spoken their voices people who take in lumps you know and people who are willing to endure that snapback that you're gonna get and that's in terms of preparation alan's point is we go very very good point about preparation you're gonna feel that preparation that like oh you're gonna feel that backlash you're gonna feel like the and people are gonna make you doubt they're going to make you doubt, like, oh, should I speak up? Oh, should I do this? Should I do that? And, you know, it's like, oh, I should probably be nice. And it's like, Ugh. you know, uh, and, and again, this is up to your, your personal tolerance, right? If you don't feel like speaking up, then it is up to you. You got to maintain your own safety. But if board game is really important to you, then it's worth verbalizing. and It's worth speaking up. And if there needs to be more allies to kind of step up and say, okay, I got your back. If you do speak up, then, then that's what it takes. And I'm very happy to do that. Absolutely. Yeah, great points, everybody. Um, so now I kind of want to talk about some of these, I, I, we kind of alluded to earlier, some of these controversial topics that people have kind of been discussing online. Um, so the first thing I want to say is, is, is everyone welcome at my table? Question mark. How might people interpret that statement? Is that a loaded statement? Uh, so you're saying everyone's welcome at my table. Are you asking if we personally have that credo ourselves or are we uh, basically dissecting that statement in general? Um, I, th I think what a lot of people have done is, well, some people are like, well, yeah, of course, everyone's welcome at my table. That's, that's how I am. Everyone can be there. Versus some other people are like, well, we need to intentionally build community. And if you say everyone is welcome, that includes, you know, neo-Nazis and racists and bigots. So mm -hmm. is, is this something we should still be saying in the board game community that everyone is welcome at my table? I will say, so this is kind of getting into like how to deal with this stuff, right? So we've talked about, um, you know, like setting up the scenarios and analyzing scenarios. Now it's like how you deal with it. And to me, yes, everyone is welcome at my table, but not every behavior is welcome at my table, right? I distinguish hard. It's, but it may be the first, it may be the, the thing I do in Shelf Stories more than anything. And it's, I think it's contributed to the success of my channel. I never use labels. I never talk stuff about people. I talk about behaviors. And so, like, the racist, the sexist, the bigot, that those are labels. And you have to really prove it. <laughs> to me, you have to, like, really show yourself a racist, a sexist, the bigot. And, you know, in order for me to kind of describe that label, but, like, racist, sexist, bigoted actions and speech, not welcome. Mm -mm. Not welcome. And if you are, if you are a person, or if the, a person out there is someone that believes that somehow they that oh well that I that's just what I think. That's just how you're you're talking to me. It's like you can always separate the act, the idea, and the the person. And if you are a person that chooses to defend that stuff, then you're not welcome. But that's your choice, right? That's your choice. That's how I kind of cleave those that I, that idea. Jason, that was beautiful. That is so important. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah it's amazing. It's so well said and very humanistic because part of the teaching realm, we teach humanism with Rogers and Maslow, this belief that inherently everyone wants the world to be better. Even if you're the most selfish person on the right. planet, you want your fellow human being to be better so that you don't have to interact with all this hostility. And I think at our core, that is really true. I believe that everyone is just trying to find their own way. And there's a lot of misguidedness mm -hmm. out there that causes people mm. to behave badly. Good point. So, yeah. And that is what you said is a perfect example of Rogerian idea is that, oh, there's no bad people, but there's bad behavior. They can mm -hmm. exhibit different things. I So, yes. Absolutely. Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's wonderful. So, yeah, I mean, and because you want to see that. We want to see all people are welcome. We don't want to, you know, because it's gotten us like, we, you know, we can get into that kind of other crouch where it's like only people of XYZ are welcome. 
and like only people of my ideological streak are open. And I don't want to say that either. Like I welcome people who disagree. I welcome, you know, if you are on the, you know, I call them my, my moderate friends <laughs> and my friends on the right. Uh, I mean, it, it, we, I've had a lot of different discussions on my comment channel and everything's like, you know, and, and a lot of times we get to a agree to disagree space. And that's part like of that, that information health that you talked about too, because right. if you have that echo chamber, you're not information healthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, if you can get to that agree to disagree space, but then agree to put that aside and like, just kind of say, okay, there's behaviors that are pro social and there are behaviors that are not pro social. Like do what you want is not pro social. It's not like, it, cause what you want, especially in our, you know, I, men are pretty kind of bad at this. Like, <laughs> you know, men are socialized to, make comments and be jerks and like unfortunately just you know because we think we need to or because you know we're trying to get the attention of women and assert our dominance and blah, 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 blah. and so like i you know i so do what you want i'm a cbt therapist our feelings lie all the time <laughs> yeah <laughs> feelings lie all the time our brain you know our, everything like our feelings are not the, the, the way to go so it's like you can't do everything where you want you have to actively call to pro social stuff but like what alan was saying i think we're all basically good and i think it's all possible to like you know if you're engaging in that behavior to like you know there's gonna be a space where it's like dude yo yo you know, or what, you know, my, my, my area, yo, at the, you know, what, you know, what, and it's like, okay, do you respond to that? And if you don't respond to that, then you're not welcome. But if you, but I'm going to give you that chance. Yeah. I, I love what you said, you know, it's, it's inviting, but still keeping your boundaries too. Like you, you're welcoming of everybody, but you no know, keeping your, your space safe. And man, that was, I was thinking like, I had this beautiful statement for this, but man, no, you just, you nailed it. <laughs> that's <laughs> sorry, great. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, that's wonderful. I could, that I I wrote that down for myself. <laughs> oh, what was the statement? What What did you want to contribute? Oh, just uh, like welcoming everybody, but keep keeping your boundaries there. What's acceptable at the table and what's not. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I I love what you said. It's you know welcoming everyone, but having standards in place for boundaries, making sure that um, people aren't you know engaging in behavior that is harmful. You no, know, like you said. Couldn't have said it better, like I said. You said it best. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think the, the one of the other keys of that is try to avoid labels. Like, labels yeah. kill us. Like, again, that's not a CDT thing. Like, a, we call it a functional thought pattern. It's like labeling, mm -hmm. right? You know, that's not analysis. Like, I, I remember uh, I got it. There was a person who disagreed with me on one of my one of my recent videos. And he says, um, God, I forget what, he, what exactly he said. But, like, it was, uh, you are trying to take things away from me. You're a tyrant. Okay, and like this is not analysis. This I can't deal with that. You know, I, I I'd love to talk to you about it, but like if that's what you're contributing, like to me, I can't work with that. I can't work with that label. I can't work with like you know. So the so the left has labels for the right, racist, sex, misogynist, da 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 da, and then the right has labels for the left, cancel culture, woke, and mob, and you know these are the these are the words, these are the buzzwords, and they become like used in place of actual human interaction that's what that's when i made the point of social media that's what i'm thinking about is like now we've reduced ourselves to label 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 and it's like you want to make a real board gaming space we got to unplug the labels and we got to get in touch with, the, with each other as people and assess behavior on a case-by-case -case basis Beautiful. love this panel so much this it's is great ridiculous <laughs> It's oh, so good. I got, I've been practicing this, man. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's just nice to hear I'm it being it. said and shared and things because absolutely, it's a reminder that you're not alone because I think maybe I'm overstepping my bounds on Jason and Haley's behalf. But one of the problems is as you're talking about this and asking people not to be a partner, I'm so grateful for individuals like you because then you realize, okay, this is invigorating. I'm not alone. I'm not crazy. Sure, I read it and I've been taught it in grad school, and uh, but it's great to actually hear it in person. I do want to say, if we're talking about pragmatics, it is totally fair for you to admit that you may be exhausted with new people at the table. So having this open table at all times can be very exhausting because... Yeah. Sometimes you need a break from educating individuals and being, and I hate saying it, being as accepting as possible 
can be exhausting. So that's the beautiful thing about conventions and having your hotel rooms and private areas with your individual friends that you can invite around your gaming table. So I love the big picture, obviously. Anyone's welcome at our gaming table, but I would want to put a little asterisk there that and allow yourself grace, as Haley said, to give yourself some private friend time as well if you need to recharge those batteries. Yeah, like this isn't like the comfort thing in terms of like safety and unsafety. This sounds like more of like an introvert extrovert and like um, energy thing, you know, and that's where I become a lot more kind. <laughs> like I'll wield the fire and the brimstone on the, on the behavior when it comes to like people who are, I don't know, like, you know, you go to a convention and you maybe, you know, you get that. And it's not, there's like a lot of emotions, right? You get a little FOMO about like, oh, that, the, all those people are hanging out. I wish I could hang out with them. Or like, okay, um, these people ask me over that, but I'm really drained. And, you know, I, I get, you know, I need to just, you know, like, it's really funny. Like, I don't know if you've been to like any, really any con, like the media room, like the media room, like, because it, it's like a, it's a sanctuary. So like it fills up with people who are just like playing on their phones <laughs> and quietly away from people. Because I think a lot of board gamers are natural introverts. So like, I think, you know, um, getting in touch with whether you are, you know, you do you get energy from being with people or does it cost you energy? Not that you like it or hate it. Best thing about introvert and expert is not about liking hate, it's about what, what where your energy is. Mm-hmm. So like realizing, okay, is this costing me energy? It's okay, I need to nurture this a little bit better and don't feel bad about that. Absolutely. And I think it's also important to note that everybody fluctuates their introversion and their extroversion. For instance, a lot of people say, oh, Alan, you're such an extrovert. But I have to tell you that after being on the show floor for eight hours a day, mm-hmm. people were like, hey, why aren't you playing games with us at night times? Like I was, did you not see me talking to <laughs> thousands of people for eight hours for the last two days? I think I'm gonna just play some role-playing games in my hotel room right. with maybe a friend or two. So, mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. So, again, give grace. I love it. So good. Yeah. But the other thing is, um, a lot of these games that we play might have themes um, that people find offensive. Um, there are things like, Jason, you did a whole episode about Puerto Rico. Um, which is, you know, all BGG top 10 for blah, 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 but it is a colonial theme. Um, it, it does take place in an era of slavery. You do not play your, pay your workers. They arrive on a ship. Uh, they are brown colored discs. Um, what, what do you think people are supposed to, you know, infer from that? It doesn't specifically say in the rule set, but again, there's a lot of inferral. Um, what about all these Orientalist games? What about people who say, uh, yeah, I did like a Google search for, 10 minutes and came up with this, you know, thing from Indonesia. So I'm going to name my game that. <laughs> Give the <laughs> thumbs down there. Uh, you know, what are cultural appropriation? You know, one Kickstarter that just came out uh, was a farming roll and write called Three Sisters. And people uh, brought up, um, well, this is a, a term from Native American culture. Did you consult with any Native American people? Were any Native American people involved with this design? And they were like, um, we have like a sentence in the book that says Three Sisters is from Native American culture. People were like, mm, could you please rethink that? And uh, to their credit, the designers actually did uh, reach out to groups and rethink that. But of course, you know, the Kickstarter was already going there. Um, and another thing is, this is something I think I personally have a lot of bias and blinders for, is what people refer to as ableist language, saying things like, oh, I'm so OCD about that, or, or oh, I'm so addicted to doing that. Or even like a game, like all these Cthulhu games, where um, a mechanic is sanity or madness. Is this something, you know, if you, you're dealing with a person who has a severe persistent mental illness, all of a sudden, like, okay, we're playing characters, and we're going to go mad, we're going to go crazy, and you won't be able to control us. Um, what what about that? You know, and especially what if you have a gaming group, and all of a sudden they suggest a game, you know, how can you speak up and advocate for yourself, like, guys, here's why I'm not comfortable playing this. So I think I have to call myself out first before we start the start the conversation because at the beginning I said well, we have acquisition disorder like we, we always want to buy the board game so there I was using that ableist language too so I think this is something that you know me personally um, I'm continuously learning about as well 
Um, you know, me as a, no, I'm, I'm a woman, but you know, I'm also a heterosexual white woman. Um, and so it's something that I have to check myself and continuously learn about. And so I think that's the big thing is, you know, check yourself, learn about things. And that's something that I'm still doing as well. Thank you, Haley. That was awesome. And that was the epitome example of pretty much my life because <laughs> I'll step in some type of doo-doo. My intentions were not that. And the reality is, is that most individuals, especially Americans, are very egocentrically focused. You know, we're an individualistic nature. And so our egos are realistically the value of our self. And so if we are all of a sudden talking Told, hey, you're doing something wrong. There's a line drawn in our minds and we have to all of a sudden be defensive and say, hey, there has to be something wrong with you because I didn't mean any harm. How dare you make me feel bad about something that I totally didn't intend to do. But going back to that, giving yourself grace and giving others grace, I think that my big thing, if I were king, god, leader, whatever, type of ultimate power that could instill some type of value on everyone instantly, it would be the understanding that it is a good thing that we learn and adapt to not be information averse, not to be change averse, but to actually take what you're hearing and consider it. Even if you disagree with it at first, understand that's probably going to be your first response. So just consider it because, man, <laughs> I've had to eat crow so many times in the past that nowadays... I'm just expecting perhaps to make a mistake. And I know that's not just a freebie. I can't just walk into a room and be like, hey, everybody, I'm really insulting and I suffer from uh, putting my foot in my mouth all the time. So you have to bear with it and you have to tell me, I don't want to put all the responsibility, but I will say that I, whether it just be to myself or openly to everyone else, I'm just going to continue to try my best and I invite people letting me know when I'm really messing up. And I think, think that is the best I can do and what I can ask everyone else to is just do your best. Intentions is one thing, but the follow-up is the other. If you intended to do good and you find out you're doing harm, well, then that good intention should lead into following through and trying to learn from the harm you may have unintentionally done. Like, yeah. I mean, we've been struggling. I think you're referencing like a lot of the different uh, controversies and everything. And there was a lot of, I didn't mean it. You know, there was a lot of, I didn't intend, I didn't intend any harm. And okay. They, you, and I don't want to fall into the trap that intent doesn't matter. I, or that intent does not matter. I don't want to fall in that trap. Intent matters. Intent, where there is intent, there could be forgiveness. Like if there's good intention, then there'll be some forgiveness that is offered to you. Like if there's bad intentions, there's no forgiveness. <laughs> but if you want, and I, I'll take people, most people are at their word, good intentions. Like you said before, Alan, uh, most of us are trying our best. You know, most of us are trying our best. So it's like, okay, the intention is there. So it's like, there'll be forgiveness. But I have to check the behavior. I have to check the behavior. And I would, and I want people to check my behavior, my statements, like, like Haley acknowledged. There's stuff that I, that comes out of my mouth because I get a little fiery and I have to like step in it a little bit. So it's like, all right. So it's like, we're checking each other's behavior and the, I didn't mean it means there's forgiveness on the other side. Doesn't mean that we're just going to let it skate or that forgiveness is cheap. Like we, I think a lot of people get into the mode of like, okay, I didn't mean it. So therefore forgive me cheaply, just accept that word. And that's it. I, just, I said, I'm sorry. It, that's not, unfortunately we're in a space where it's, that's not good enough. And I did a whole video on this and I got some pushback for it and we can continue to talk about it where like if, if the infraction, especially if it's across cultures, or it's a it's different people like there's an infraction that whether it's a power differential, you know, a, a man towards a woman, a, a, a white towards a POC. Like if there's a, an infraction across boundaries, the and the further the boundary away is, the less I didn't mean is going to matter. The more that you really have to step up with some kind of like active, rest you know thing that fixes the behavior, you know. So I mean I don't know if we're uh, <laughs> I, I, you started somewhere, we're kind of ending up somewhere else, but I think in terms of the intent and the impact, you know, like kind of weighing both of those things, like intent will, like intent opens the door to forgiveness, but it doesn't mitigate impact. You still need to own the impact. 
I think that's kind of how I, you know, resolved the two in my head. So now, so we've kind of talked about a lot of different issues here. And now I kind of want to talk about, you know, specifically kind of like the, the broader mental health perspective. Um, like you and uh, Haley, you and Jason kind of mentioned like, you know what, your feelings lie. Um, and I don't think that's something a lot of people are aware of. So I kind of oh, want to talk about this. Every broader. movie is going to tell you, listen to your heart. No, don't listen to your heart. No. <laughs> Feelings ain't facts, my friend. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. There, that's a great. This is point. total wow. therapist geek human ass. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna start our own panel with CBT and nerd stuff. <laughs> Heck yeah! Yeah, <laughs> coming soon. CBT podcast. Um, so, kind of like, let's talk about what are the causes and effects of stress on an individual. You know what. You know what what happens when you know all of a sudden okay I'm fine all of a sudden uh oh I'm in a stressful in, you know situation you know what is happening there what is happening you know physically and mentally to me I can give a quick answer in a very professorial way of that there's direct effects and there's indirect effects of stress the indirect effects of stress are the things that are bad for us that we do in order to cope with the stress, whether it be drinking or fighting or jumping over the Springfield Gorge or whatever you're doing that could be very adverse to your health. The direct effects of stress have to do with your lymphocytes. Without getting into too many details or the weeds, basically you have a sympathetic nervous system response as if you're getting attacked. So thinking back to ancient times or nowadays, if you feel like you're being physically attacked, you have that flight or fight response and it floods. And part of that is it releases your lymphocytes, your white blood cells, your antibodies. And you do not have an unlimited amount of those antibodies. And plus that sympathetic nervous system response has very specific steps to it, including turning off your digestive system so that that oxygen can go elsewhere, your muscles, your heart, et cetera, because you're getting ready to fight or run. And that's great in a short term to save your life, if a snake's trying to attack you or running away from a tiger or something like that, you need that extra burst of strength and speed. But when you're actually sitting across for an awkward conversation at Thanksgiving dinner, or you're not sure what's going on at convention, and more importantly, if that's prolonged, then you have the Hansley three-stage general adaptation syndrome where you have the first stage of alarm, then you have resistance, which is your body starts pacing itself, realizing we're running out of lymphocytes, we better start pacing these lymphocyte, lymphocyte release. And then the last stage is exhaustion, where you basically are out of lymphocytes, and that causes you to have a whole bunch of problems, let alone the ulcers you may be having in your stomach because you're eating when you're upset. But also, you could have opportunistic things that you already have been vaccinated for could actually affect you because you've already exhausted your lymphocytes. So there's amazing cases of this. So that's the very... I said it was going to be a quick answer. I guess it wasn't as quick as I wanted it to be. Indirect you did say effects. Professor Ariel, so there you go. Yeah, yeah I did say You're Professor. Half right. <laughs> half right. But yeah, the other one is it takes a physical toll on your body for sure. Yeah, the, uh, a really good book about that is uh, called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Are you familiar with that one? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I'm not. Please educate me. <laughs> <laughs> well, they talks about the parasympathetic nervous system and how like that uh, that response shuts down our soft organs and how over the long term we give ourselves ulcers and liver problems when we have that constant stress up, you know, and that constant vigilance. And it actually folds in with what Haley was saying about like, you know, women being comfortable in a space like that, you know, when you're a, a woman or, or, or a, you know, a POC who doesn't feel comfortable, that's up all the time. And, you know, you will get, you will get, you know, uh, you know, what, what's the stomach ache called? <laughs> oh my God, I'm choking. Um, stomach ache, whatever. Um, you'll get like, you know, these internal problems, like you'll have to go to the bathroom a lot or you, or you get dizzy and, you know, you'll like, it's physiological, this stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, so you asked where it comes from. Right. You asked, like, you know, what triggers this response? What triggers the, the lymphocytes? What triggers the, the cortisol and the adrenaline kind of stuff? And it's pretty I, I think it's pretty simple. And I'm actually going to go reach back way back. This is this is Buddhist. This is Buddhist stuff. 
And it's like, you know, the, like the root of suffering is desire, grasping, right? Wanting something that we can't have or wanting something that's not accessible to us. And so like stress is like, okay, I want to play board games, but there's all these problems. So like, I want to play board games, but then these problems are happening. So now I'm all stressed out. Or like, I, you know, I, I want to play board games right now, but I want to feel safe. So now I'm stressing because I, I want this thing. I want just to play, you know, and now I'm, and now this thing is coming at me, you know? So like, you know, and the, and we want, these are good things to want, right? <laughs> we want, uh, but unfortunately, like barriers get in the way. And we're at the, bar the exact barriers that we've been discussing. So it's like, it's good to know, like, if you're feeling stressed, it's like, okay, what am I, what do I want? And what, how is it being frustrated? And is it worth it? Is it, do, now I, now I like see, take a multi-step process. It's like, okay, you know, I'm feeling the lymphocytes. I'm feeling the, the tightness in my stomach. I'm feeling it in my body. I'm feeling tense. I'm feeling all this stuff, right? Flag. <laughs> so it, it comes from, okay, what do I want here? And how, when, why am I not getting it? What are my unmet needs? in the nonviolent communication thing. Like uh, I'm getting needs and how are they unmet now? So it's like, okay, and, and what are the barriers to that? And can I do anything about it? Mm -hmm. And maybe, you know, maybe I can, or maybe I can't, but that's a good, a good beginning mental process to go through in, in terms of dealing with the stress. Absolutely. So I, I love what you both said, you know, talking about the biological underpinnings of it, as well as, you know, finding the root because our, our, our emotions, you know, they're all always feelings, but they can give us a lot of clues into what we need. You know, I always say like, this is a, you guys are going to be really sciencey. I'm going to be very metaphory. Um, you know, feelings are kind of like our sixth sense. You know, they tell us um, clues into what we what we need. You know, if we're happy, what's the reason? If we're stressed, what's the reason? If we're anxious, what's the reason? So if we pay attention to those feelings and try to figure out where they're coming from, you know, that's going to be um, more helpful than, you know, doing something that masks them or doing something that ignores them in a way. So I love what you said, Jason, about, you know, finding the root. What is this telling me? Because that's very important. Right. If the fire alarm's going off, you don't shut the alarm off. You look for the fire. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so many people just want to shut the alarm off okay stop it you know get over yourself it's like there's an alarm over here <laughs> there's something that's causing the stress you know i'm feeling right. stressed where is this stress or <laughs> how right. is it stopping me from getting what i want and, I, and can i deal with it man i'm stealing that one <laughs> so stealing that one <laughs> Uh, I use that one a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's going to get a lot of mileage. Wow. Yeah, that's really so smart. And this is why, again, why I had you guys on. You're also smart. You explain things so well. I'm just like, I don't know. I feel bad. I don't know what to do. <laughs> the fire alarm's going off. Like, feeling bad is actually what, what exactly what Alan said. These are ancient mechanisms. This goes back to, this is, we are human animals, and they evolved, like, we needed that. This is good. It's working. You know, feeling anxious, feeling depressed. That, you know, I try to help my clients reframe that. They try to, you know, they come in with the mindset, I feel terrible. I want to feel better. And like, I don't want to feel depressed anymore. I don't want to feel anxious anymore. And it's like, okay, you know, we'll do this therapy and like, I'll convince myself it's okay and I'll take a pill, whatever it is. And I'm trying to, and a lot, a lot of times I'll say like, let's reframe that. It means that your body's working. It means that it's picking up something. And it's like, the problem isn't the feeling. The problem is that something outside of your environment is causing you to feel this. And we need to deal with that. Like we need, and you know, so I know we're talking in like a high level, but like in a board game scenario, like I, like, you know, every, like every, we all want the same thing. We all want to play board games, right? And so like, if you're feeling stressed about what should be a fun thing, like it is worth the effort to drill down and say, okay, what exactly is it that is causing this? Is it because I'm uncomfortable because of COVID? Is it because I'm uncomfortable because these men are doing things? Is it uncomfortable because I think these SJWs are being too annoying and whatever, whatever? Is it because whatever it is? And once you have that thing, once you've identified the fire, you've gotten away, you've listened to the alarm and now you're at the fire, that's so much more, you can do much more with it. And, you know, Haley, you'll, you'll talk about that. Like we're, we're behavioral. Like we're, this is all about like, okay, now we need, now we, now that we've gotten to the cognitive, figured it out, let's figure out a behavior to respond to this stressor. We're not just about identifying stuff. We want to make it better. 
Don't mind me, I'm just drawing the cognitive triangle over here. <laughs> <laughs> now, a lot of people don't know what the third one is, if memory serves me correctly, because if it's a triangle, you have behavior, cognition. Is it environment? Is that what they're... Emotion. Feelings. Okay. All right. It's affect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. The the one that I've used, and it is not as good as the fire alarm one at all, is uh, make sure you use your feelings and you don't let them use you. So mm -hmm. it's one of these things where that's using your fire analogy. Absolutely. That it's telling you that there's fire and then using your feelings to let you know, instead of letting them absolutely consume you. And that is the whole point of all of your behavior is nothing but emoting these feelings and letting them consume you. But man, well and said. It might, be, it might be that the problem is unsolvable. Like it might be that, and that sucks, right? You know, it might be that you feel too uncomfortable this day. It might be that there's too many issues. Like, and so you, you know, and so many you know, POC and women and other people have felt like un too uncomfortable and, and they have to check out. Like, that's okay. Do what you got to do. Raise your voice elsewhere so that the next thing is more comfortable. You mentioned before about like uncomfortable board games, right? You know, games with sanity, games with colonials and games or whatever. It's like, okay, the, the stress is I, like, you know, because you're going to get that table, like, you know, think, well, what? Just It's just a game, right? And it's like, okay, this is stressing me out, like looking at this. It should be good enough to just, okay, I'm checking out on this and I'm going to say, I'm going to use my voice elsewhere so that, you know, the next game, the next thing is better, right? And that's, that's an acceptable response too. Yeah, I think that's, that's great. And especially what you guys were talking about there, it's not, you know, it's not just mental, it's also physical. You know, this is a, you know, a physiological response. And, you know, if your body, like you said, Jason, if, arms are going off there's a fire you know what i just i just can't handle this right now guys and maybe we'll talk about it later maybe we won't but you know we're just you know i think it goes back to you know respecting that kind of mutual respect there if somebody's communicating i feel uncomfortable i don't want to do this be like okay um if you feel like sharing you know why you why you don't feel comfortable that's great but if you need to bounce that's fine or you know what we can just put this game away and play sushi go or i don't know what's a some abstract strategy, something. I don't know. There has to be some game that <laughs> doesn't have any triggers, but it's good. Like it's something cat themed. <laughs> something cat themed. Great idea, hit. But I'm allergic Cow to cats. cats. Hey, I'm allergic to cats. I'm getting <laughs> getting anxious. I'm so sorry. It's fine. Feeling uh, more about this. Um, okay, so kind of to, to wrap up, we've talked about a whole bunch of things. You know, if there are people out there who are watching this and say, you know, hey, this is me, or hey, this is somebody I know, how do people find the resources? You know, that's the hardest thing. You know, we have a real a challenge with mental health in this country first off admitting that we actually have you know a challenge with mental health but also finding the resources there are lots of barriers there they can be financial uh they can be you know cultural they can be just you know personal you know what 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 steps should people um you know how can they find resources what are things available to help people get connected with mental health resources so one of my favorites is 211. So you can either call 211 or you can type in your state name dot 211.org. And that's going to take you to a um, resource of local case managers. It has bill support. It has um, local low cost or free therapist. Um, it, so something that we you know forget sometimes it's, it's hard to take care of your mental health when you can't pay your bills. It's hard to take care of your mental health if you have an abscess tooth and you don't have health insurance. I mean, do mindfulness. My tooth is falling out. Like, no, I can't, I can't do that. And so sometimes you mental health care is also taking care of bills, is taking care of our medical needs. And so I really love 211 because, and like I said, every state has one. It's state specific. So if you call 211, no matter where you are, you're going to be connected with resources in your state. But it has resources for both for all steps of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I guess you'd say. Any resources that I would share would be the ones that Haley would share because she was on our Tuesday night play cast for this exact reason. She shared all the resources possible and 211 was a big one for sure. The one thing that I will contribute is encouraging people to seek help, 
So even though you have the resources, please use them, even if you think finances are limited because there's something known as a sliding scale, because they don't want your finances to be something that prevents you from getting mental health. There's very specific rules as far as mental health goes. For instance, a lot of private, you're not allowed to advertise as a private practitioner. That's why you don't see like billboards saying like, hey, not feeling happy, come see Dr. Bill, you call this number, et cetera, because there's ethical guidelines to make sure there's no harm being done. And part of that is making sure there's no exploitation. So whether you're very wealthy, whether you're very poor, wherever your situation is, there is mental health available to you, ideally. The, the world's trying to make it available to you. We talked at the beginning of the call about what the pandemic did, good or bad. One of the things that the pandemic did that was good was reduce all the regulations around telehealth. So we've always had the ability to do telehealth. Well, not always, but like since like 2010 or something. But it's always been like regulations in the way. Like, is it people are worse averse? It's like, wow, this is crazy. And then the pandemic hit, and it was like, zoop, go for it. And it's been a big social experiment, and it's been generally a huge success. People like having phone, video. I've seen clients, they've been on the toilet, just like, you know, doing stuff. And, you know, uh, the kids are yelling in the background and any parent knows the bathroom is usually the only sanctuary. So it's like, there it is, there they are. And it's, it's it never been easier. So, I mean, we're overwhelmed. <laughs> so that's our problem though. <laughs> that's, Over 40 and- clients in a week? Every week. That's crazy. <laughs> Every single week. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. That was insensitive. <laughs> that is a lot of work. The record is forty-seven. It's it was, oh wow. my gosh! I took a I took a nap. I took a like week long weekend long nap after that one. Uh, but, oh, I mean, right. it was actually during the pandemic, honestly, because it was like so many people needed help, and so many like you know parents and you know so they and to you know to their credit they sought it out and they, it was there for them. So um, and I did. I guess uh, another thing I'll say in terms of barriers is there's a lot of you mentioned before, David, about uh, psychological barriers, stigma. You know, like there's so much shame that gets involved in, oh, I, you know, I don't want to talk to a therapist. I should be able to take care of this on my own. Or there's cultural stuff. A lot of cultures don't, they, you know, like, what is this Western thing? You know? And it's like, you know, I'm like, and I, I can only speak for myself. I'm, I'm a guy. I'm a, I'm a, you, what you see is what you get, what you see on this zoom call, what you see on my YouTube channel, what you see in my therapy, they're not that different. Right. I'm just, I put my pants on one well, at a time. I got two kids. Up, I got a wife. I got a mortgage. And I, you know, I, I'm, this is all like, I know, I know therapy gets the stigma of like, okay, doctor triggers that kind of white coat thing. That's not modern therapy. That's not CBT therapy. That's, I mean, <laughs> you know, there's Welcome a to my office. <laughs> of, right. You know, we're real people and we, you know, we happen to study some of this stuff. So we have a little bit of a leg up, you know, in terms of what to do and, 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 how, and all that stuff. So just, but we are real people would take advantage and there's no shame there's no shame and i hope what i'm about to say doesn't scare you in a way but there's good mechanics and there's bad mechanics there's good lawyers and there's bad lawyers there's amazing therapists and there's bad therapists so if you have a bad experience with a therapist change them change them yeah you're fired change them change them no shame no shame in that change them i've been fired it's fine i'm fine it's about the mix it's about the connection you find the connection and just, you know, and, and it, there's no, there is no shame in, in any of that. No. We're not going to, when I'm, I'm not going to like grade you. <laughs> no. Something I really love and why, why I chose to work where I work is that uh, my agency offers one 20 minute consultations for free to kind of test out the therapist. But two, if you do the whole intake with the therapist and you find out like, I, I don't like the theoretical orientation or I don't like their vibe or um, she looks a little squirrely with her tattoos. We don't know the insurance for that. Like it, ha- it's so like welcome that you can switch your therapist. Like we won't even bill your insurance if you find out we do an intake and you don't. We don't click. That's fine. Change your therapist. Don't, don't settle because that person, um, you know, they're there to help you. And I tell my clients, I work for you. I want to make sure I'm doing a good job. I want to make sure we're doing a good. We're, we are a good fit. Yeah. Change them. Fire them. Like Jason said. <laughs> Get there, there, we, you know, there, there's a therapist shortage. Like, there's not enough of us, and like, we need more. So, I guess that'll this will be another thing. It's like, you know, don't be afraid to, you know, dip your toe and you know, getting an LPC or getting an LPSW is at LCSW or all these things are not as difficult as, 
you know, going to med school for five years. I mean, this it's 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 still too high a barrier. It's still a little bit too long, kind of you know, training. But the trade off is it does weed out you know difficult actors and the people who do make it through that stuff. It are if you're licensed, then we earned it. We don't yeah. give these things away. Which so, I think is an important part is making sure that you're getting someone who is licensed. Right. Rely on the license. You know, the, we don't, they don't give them away. You know, Haley earned her license and I earned my license. And, you know, we, this, if, if that opens a door for you, you know, a little bit of trust door. And then as Haley said, just engage and see for yourself and do it. You know, it, it, it's there for you. It really is. Haley, what's another resource besides 211 that you would recommend? So um, one that I really like is the National Alliance for Mental Illness, um, so NAMI.org, uh, N-A-M-I. So they have not only uh, state-specific groups, so like Oklahoma in particular, uh, there's groups for survivors of suicide, for um, parents, for uh, uh, families with of those with mental illness, but they also have a lot of culturally specific resources as well. Uh, I was on a podcast last week uh, this is Yonez Rebeles uh, with my friend Eduardo, and I was talking about um, mental health care and you know, his podcast there's a lot in the Hispanic community. And so NAMI had a lot of uh, resources for um, Spanish speaking psychiatrists. Um, and you typed in your zip code in the database and it can pull up psychiatrists speak Spanish. Or um, they also have uh, resources for those of different religions or those of gen different gender uh, or sexual orientations. And so I really like NAMI. There's a lot of great resources there. It's basically just a, a big database of other databases, but it's a really great place to start to find someone to meet your needs. And NAMI does groups. You know, yes. and don't be afraid of groups. Don't be afraid of groups. Well, so many of my clients, they, oh, I don't want to talk to a lot of people. There's a lot of people that are experiencing exactly what you're experiencing. It's validating. Don't be afraid. It is all valid and it is so affirming. And NAMI does a great job. And there's, there's, and there's local ones too. Like you can go to your local hospitals. You can go to your, uh, like every every single hospital. Like if you have, especially because they're now they're networked. There's a lot of like, you know, kind of these network things. So like going in the door, one of them will, might lead you to, you know, somewhere along three, four, and it's frustrating to go through, but, you know, the, at least the links are there. So if you just kind of put a little bit of elbow grease until you might find something. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you again, everybody. This is great resources. And, you know, this is such an important topic, you know, not just for the board game community, like we we're talking about here for, you know, everybody, um, especially, you know, after what we're all kind of like dealing with here now. And I think, you know, a lot of what we said here, is you know trying to be compassionate not just towards others but also towards yourself and um <clears throat> you know as we get back to kind of in-person uh activities you know keep that in mind that you know um you know we're all we're all just trying to figure it out and people make mistakes um but you know you also have to you know think about yourself what 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 do i need what is important for me uh but again thank you so much uh alan haley jason uh, I'll put links to this video uh, to all your different, uh, all your different accounts. I highly suggest people check them out. And again, it's not all it's not all serious stuff like this. You know, there's a lot of fun stuff there too. Um, you know, um, things like that. Uh, so thank you again for participating, and I really appreciate it. And I'll talk to you all later. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Bye, hey, everybody. Bye.